and to make sure that we have the most far-reaching attitude for our time together today, I'm just going to invite you to call to mind one or more of the qualities that you associate with kindness or kind people. Maybe they are imbued with warmth or friendliness, caring, compassion, acceptance, gentleness, affection, consideration for others, generosity. Which, which one really stands out for you? One or two that stand out for you. And then just imagine those qualities fully developed within yourself right now. Imagine you have cultivated it to perfection. Cultivate the wish to extend these qualities towards all the people that you easily love, beginning with your family and friends, your relatives. That's probably pretty easy. We already do that to some extent. But then let's challenge ourselves. Imagine being able to extend these qualities even to people we consider strangers, those we don't know, those we pass on the street during the day, people in our neighborhood we don't really know, people we pass on the street. Imagine being able to extend those same qualities consistently, full-heartedly. And then imagine extending these qualities even to those one or two people who you find challenging, difficult, those who push our buttons. Just imagine being able to spontaneously extend these qualities towards even the most difficult people we encounter. And so if we can do it with these specific people, then we can imagine extending this, these qualities of kindness towards every living being, every person we come in contact with, every person we think about, even those we have difficulty even calling to mind. Extending it to every single living being. So with that little taste, then let's develop an aspiration, a wish, a motivation that our time together this morning in the session as well as throughout the weekend. We're listening to these teachings about developing kindness, reflecting on them, meditating on them, so that they become a cause for developing these qualities in our lives, so that we may truly be able to benefit all other living beings in the most genuine and far-reaching way. morning. Did everyone sleep well? <coughs> You're not saying if you didn't. <laughs> it's a perfect Dharma day to be inside. It's raining. <laughs> okay, so we're here this weekend to talk about kindness and how to cultivate greater kindness within ourselves. And um, as we said, kindness is kind of a vague term, actually. You know, it's, it's the quality or state of being kind. Um, being friendly, generous, considerate. Um, it includes behavior marked by a pleasant, a pleasant disposition, ethical characteristics. I don't think we've mentioned that um, specifically, but ethical, it has an ethical dimension to it, doesn't it? And concern and consideration for others. And I would say it's thanks to 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama that uh, in his encouragement in the 1980s in the Mind and Life conferences that um, where he, he met with scientists and researchers and he encouraged them to research positive states of mind rather than just negative states of mind and afflictions. At that time there was a lot of research on anger and depression but not much was known about compassion and mindfulness and loving kindness and those sorts of things. You know, today even Reader's Digest carries stories about the, the benefits of mindfulness and the benefits of meditation. So <laughs> it's pretty commonplace. And like mindfulness and compassion, kindness is currently a trendy research topic due to its causal relationship with experiencing happiness. Um, happiness sells, have you noticed? I saw a car commercial one time that said, um, buy this car, more room for happiness. <laughs> So I would propose that kindness includes a huge spectrum, everything from simple acts of kindness, like just smiling at someone or offering a helping hand, all the way up to complete enlightenment. Think about it. Wishing to achieve enlightenment, to be able to benefit others, isn't that like the ultimate kind of kindness you can think about? We can explore that this weekend. For centuries, philosophers and scientists have asked whether humans are more self-interested or altruistic. And historically, it's been thought that as a species, our actions are largely selfish and self-centered, which may have been fueled by this term, survival of the fittest, often attributed to Charles Darwin. This idea suggests that the basic instinct to survive means that we have to look out for ourselves first and foremost. His Holiness often remarks that since all of us want happiness and don't want suffering, then if we show others kindness, love, respect, consideration, they will respond in kind with kindness, love, respect, and consideration. And if we do the opposite, if we treat others with anger, disrespect, contempt, we can count on them showing us something similar. So he says if we're going to be selfish, I think drawing on that idea that It's actually a myth, I think, but let's check. That if we're going to be selfish, then he says we should be wisely selfish and treat everyone just as well as we treat those who are really close to us. Now, just just as an aside, Darwin studied human evolution, but he didn't actually see mankind as being biologically competitive, greedy, and self-interested. He believed that we are a profoundly social and caring species. He even argued that sympathy and caring for others has a biological basis. They are instinctual and necessary for survival. I was interested to uh, learn that this term, survival of the fittest, was actually coined by someone else, Herbert Spencer, in 1864, after he read Darwin's uh, book on the origin of species. And it seems that it was adopted by social Darwinists to justify class class and race superiority. So it was co-opted. It wasn't the intent. Actually, in Darwin's book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, he describes the greater strength of social or maternal instincts than that of any other instinct or motive that living beings have. So he makes the point that communities which include the greatest number and of the most sympathetic members would flourish best, not the most competitive, the most sympathetic and rear the greatest number of offspring. That was the point, you know, to keep the species going. His research and observations actually espouse survival of the kindest, survival of the most compassionate. Because without kindness and compassion, the survival and flourishing of our species would have been unlikely. So kindness may indeed be a naturally evolved and adaptive trait. However, it's interesting that current research seems to be capitalizing literally, (laughs) on its causal connection with happiness. So selfless acts of giving, whether it's offering a smile, a kind word of encouragement, a helping hand, or even generating great compassion, result in an emotional lift, not only for ourselves, but, uh, not only for others, but for ourselves. And that seems to be what the scientists are focusing a lot on. This will be good for you if you generate kindness. And there's nothing wrong with that as a starting point. Nothing wrong at all. It's a good starting point. We we do want to be happy, and we have every right to happiness. But if that's our only motive for generating kindness, it might be a little bit short-sighted. 
So I, uh, if you Google kindness research, you'll find all sorts of interesting research papers and summaries. And I encourage you to do that. I found it very interesting to read some of the things that are out there now. Basically, there are two ways to think about kindness. We can think about it from a scientific point of view. We can think about it as a fixed trait, something you either have or you don't have. Or we can think of kindness as a muscle. In some people, that muscle is naturally stronger than in others. Um, but it can grow stronger in everyone with exercise. And Buddhism would agree with that second idea. Whatever positive states of mind we have, they can be increased simply by focusing on them, by giving them our attention, by co consciously cultivating them. So performing acts of kindness may well be a choice. But the ability and the tendency to be kind appears to be actually something innate in all of us, something we have even in infancy. I read some research that demonstrated that children begin to help others at an astonishingly young age. Uh, one example was a 14-month-old child seeing an adult experience difficulty, such as struggling to open a door because their hands were full, automatically attempted to help. And even children as young as three months have been shown puppet shows in research where a small dog tries to lift a heavy bag and a kind teddy bear comes to help him. And then once again, the small dog is struggling to lift the bag and a mean bunny appears and takes the bag. <laughs> this is a three-month-old. So after the puppet show, the infants were shown both the teddy bear and the bunny. And children invariably stared at, you guessed, the bear. And so staring is associated with liking in young children that don't have language yet. Uh, also, there's a dilation of the eyes that's being monitored. Um, so perhaps we can say that when we perform acts of kindness, we are being true to our own nature, and this naturally makes us feel good. We're being true to our nature. We're honoring what's true for us. Pos positive states of mind actually accord with reality. Last night, um, Venable Jigme described how loving kindness is the wish for others to have happiness and its causes. From a Buddhist point of view, it's described that these positive states of mind can be developed in all of us to their utmost extent. So, wishing for someone to have happiness accords with reality. Whereas, when we think about negative states of mind, if we investigate, they have some distortion in them. Like with attachment, there's some exaggeration of the positive qualities. You know, we're not really in relationship to the person or the object that we're thinking about or looking at. We're in relationship with our thought about it. And then we cling to that thought, thinking as if it's fused with the actual object. And then we're disappointed when our projection and the actual object don't match up. Uh, some of you might be interested in this one article I found in the Atlantic magazine. It reported that kindness is the glue that keeps couples together. The research quoted uh, claimed that kindness, along with emotional stability, is the most important predictor of satisfaction and long-term stability in marriage. What would you have guessed it would have been? W would you have guessed kindness or maybe something else? They said that throughout the day, partners often make requests for connection. Like if someone is really into um, bird watching and they see a beautiful little blue finch outside, they might say to their partner, oh, come look at the bird. And so people who turn towards their partner's request in the study, um, showing interest and support, they found that those relationships, people who consistently turn towards their partner's request, those relationships lasted longer had a greater uh, survival rate. These connecting interactions have profound effects on marital well-being, while neglecting even small moments of emotional connection prove to wear away at relationships. And I think that's true of any relationship, not just um, couples, but any kind of relationship, any like here in our community even. Such kindness makes each partner feel cared for, understood, and validated and loved. 
Couples who had divorced after a six-year follow-up had only met these small requests for connection 33% of the time. So check up. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> you know, instead of saying, mm, oh, uh, yeah, mm, that's, that's nice, babe. <laughs> continuing to read the paper or text your friend. Maybe you could look up and say, tell me more. What are you interested in? They have found that contempt is the number one factor that tears couples apart. People who are focused on criticizing their partners miss a whopping 50% of positive things their partners are doing. And they see negativity when it's not there. I don't know if it's exactly 50%, but that was what the research said. (laughs) So the lesson from the research was clear. If you want to have a stable, healthy relationship, exercise kindness early and often. There's also now a great deal of evidence showing that uh, the more someone receives or witnesses kindness, the more they will be kind themselves, which leads to an upward spiral of love and generosity in all of our relationships. And this is a fascinating feature of kindness. It appears to be contagious, inspiring kindness in others. In the conclusion of one study that I came across, um, after watching a cooperative kind action of another person, Uh, Subjects mimicked the kind, cooperative behavior with others they interacted with later who were unrelated to the first incident. And that the original kindness and cooperation spread up to three degrees of separation from the original act of kindness. So that means that one person's kind action influenced another person who influenced another, another person who influenced another person. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. Exponential growth of kindness. So when we are kind, we are contributing to a kinder world to live in. We can trust that. When we regularly engage in acts of kindness, we create neural pathways that Venerable Jigme mentioned that enhance good feelings of well-being and the natural flow of feel-good endorphins and mood-elevating neurotransmitters. We're reading a lot about those in the research. (laughs) We want happiness. We want more of those endorphins, don't we? Nothing wrong with that. But if we're engaged in kindness acts primarily so that we feel good ourselves, then chances are good we have a mixed motivation. And we've been talking about the importance of our motivation. Uh, Such a motivation. So if we're engaging in kindness primarily so that we feel good ourselves, then we may have a mixed motivation. It's wrapped up with attachment that exaggerates the kind of results we can actually achieve. So Buddhism offers us more choices of how to engage in kindness that can bring limitless rewards. So I'd like to talk the majority of the talk this morning, I'd like to frame the majority of the talk this morning around some quotes by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Maybe you've seen this one on a bumper sticker, Kindness is my religion. Have you seen that? I think it was drawn from a a longer quote that says, This is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. The philosophy is kindness. When I first read this, I began to wonder what His Holiness meant when he said that his religion is kindness. The philosophy of his religion is kindness. Surely he's not just talking about little acts of, random acts of kindness. You know that statement, random, practice random acts of kindness and senseless, senseless acts, acts of beauty? I think it should be rewritten as act, um, engage in conscious acts of kindness and purposeful <laughs> acts of beauty. <laughs> Why be random about it? <laughs> Let's be intentional. In one of his books called How to Practice, The Way to a Meaningful Life, The Dalai Lama begins the introduction, just the introduction, with two very packed sentences that have really had an impact on my mind when I've thought about them. He says, I travel to many places around the world, and whenever I speak to people, I do so with a feeling that I am a member of their own family. Although we may be meeting for the first time, I accept everyone as a friend. In truth, we already know one another profoundly, as human beings who share the same basic goals. We all seek happiness and we do not want to suffer. 
That sounds like a pretty kind attitude to me. And if we could honestly say what His Holiness says in this paragraph, that we could accept everyone we meet as a friend and feel that we're a member of their own family, I think several things would be true. One is that we'd be much happier with people. <laughs> we would have much greater peace of mind and well-being. We would have fewer problems like, like anxiety and depression, sense of isolation and low self-esteem. We'd probably feel like our, mind, our, our life was profoundly meaningful. So I'm curious, is this consistent with your experience of meeting others? It's not mine, although I can honestly say I want it to be, but it's not, not yet. We may feel this way towards a few select people, maybe our partners, our children, our siblings, or maybe a few really close friends. But how about our neighbors that live down the street, especially the strange one? <laughs> maybe the one who takes his garbage out in his bathrobe or something. <laughs> Or what about the person in the car next to you when you're sitting at the traffic light? Or you know when you go to the grocery store and you happen to pass the same person going the opposite way on each aisle? Hmm. How about them? Do we think about them in this way? Or the person standing in front of us at the post office or the bank? Do we even think about them? Do we even think about their lives, what their lives are like? And specifically about the fact that we're the same in wanting happiness and wanting to be free of suffering? Or is our habit to feel more unrelated, distant, cut off, apathetic, not even thinking about them, actually? In moments when we meet others, it's possible that sometimes our reactions are uh, controlled by outer circumstances. You know, if we're tired, um, if we've had a difficult day, maybe we're more, more likely to be indifferent. If we've had a really good day, we've had a good sleep at night, we've had a good day, we wake up on the right side of the bed, then maybe it's easier to be kind and see others in a positive light. But other than those external circumstances, it can be helpful to pay attention to our basic inclination, what we might call a set point or a trait for relating to others. You know, a lot of that is conditioned. It's, it's conditioned by um, you know, what we've experienced in this life. It's conditioned by um, maybe the karma that we brought with us from previous lives. But the good news, the underlying news, is that this can change. Whatever our set point is for kindness, for seeing others as close to us, this can change. So it's interesting to question, what's the difference between our set point, our usual attitudes and and uh, thoughts about others, and those of His Holiness. You know, why is it that wherever He goes, He sees people as a friend and as part of His family, and we see people like we do? What's the difference? It's suggested that perhaps we don't live with a deep enough understanding of our own nature and the nature of others. So we've thrown this term around quite a bit, you know, we all want happiness, we want to be free of suffering, but do we really understand that at the deepest level? Or is it that we live too superficially? We, we really haven't thought about that much. Or simply that our mind isn't trained to react automatically in the way that His Holiness does. You know, that's a sign of deep training, actually. I remember one time, uh, one of my teachers came into the room and he said, why is it when someone criticizes you, you get angry immediately? He said, why isn't, why isn't it that your automatic response isn't more like, wow, that person's suffering today, I wonder how I can help them. He said, that could just as easily be our automatic response. It's just that we've trained in one and we haven't trained in the other. It's that simple. It's really, it really comes down to habit. Our minds are a product of everything we've thought. And unless we're intentional about how we're thinking, guess what the automatic response is? Or the habitual response is? We have to check up to see. It'll be an indication of what we've been doing with our minds in the past. 
So what's the result of this difference between His Holiness's way of being and our way of being? Well, he appears to be the happiest human being on the planet. I guess there's some competition with Matthew Ricard, but <laughs> he's right up there in the top ten. Meanwhile, we continue to feel the way we do. <laughs> and we suffer, don't we? We suffer, and the people around us suffer, and we continue to create suffering for others. And none of us has this peace of mind and consistent deep well-being and joy that His Holiness has, even when he's jet-lagged. I've seen him get off a plane from a whole other time zone and go right into a teaching. And he's fresh. I mean, he, he, you know, his doctor said, you must rest more. But I think <laughs> from his own side, his mind is fresh. Maybe his body's tired, but his mind is fresh. So what is it that we don't understand? What is it that we're missing? that we don't have a deep enough understanding of. His Holiness explains that we don't understand the basic nature of conscious beings, the very nature of the conventional mind, its fundamental feature, which is that all beings, all minds, at a very deep, innate level, are seeking happiness and don't want to suffer. So this is more than just the superficial level that we usually operate on. In another book called How to Be Compassionate, um, His Holiness puts it this way, When I speak with people, I do so with the sense that I am a member of their family. Although you and I may be meeting for the first time, I accept you as a friend. I do not do so as a Buddhist, <coughs> nor as a Tibetan, nor as the Dalai Lama. I do so as one human being speaking with another. If you and I find common ground as human beings, we can communicate on a basic level. But if I think I am a monk or I am a Buddhist, these are peripheral in comparison to my nature as a human being. Whether you are educated or uneducated, young or old, rich or poor, is secondary. In truth, you and I already know each other profoundly as human beings who share the same basic goals. We all seek happiness and we do not want suffering. So it's worth investigating how deeply do I know this about myself. Because the more we understand about ourselves and how our mind operates, automatically the more we understand about others. So we usually think of happiness and suffering as ordinary feelings that come and go, accidental things. You know, if we encounter something good, we're happy. If we encounter something bad or unpleasant, we suffer. But when he says we all seek happiness, he's not talking about the usual way we think of happiness and suffering. He's talking about a very fundamental nature of our mind that is always seeking happiness. Do you know that about yourself? In every moment, you're seeking happiness? So the point here is that we are hardwired at the most subtle level to seek happiness and well-being. Everything we do, the way we think, the way we dress, the way we wear our hair, the way we speak to others, every relationship we engage in, every action we do with our body, speech, and mind, is built on this underlying organizing principle. What's going to make me happy? It's mostly at an innate, unconscious, primitive level. It's below the conscious activity of our mind, even. But we can make it more conscious. Even when we or someone else engages in a harmful action, at some level, we think it will make us happy. Isn't that crazy? You know, isn't that what we think sometimes? I'll tell that person what I think about them. Ha ha, then I'll feel satisfied. As if that will bring some real satisfaction, some happiness. So, to demonstrate this, I'm just going to ask you to do a little review. So think about all the actions that you've done this morning. What was the first thing you saw when you woke up? You don't have to say it out loud. <laughs> Just reflect. <laughs> what were your first thoughts? Besides going to the bathroom, okay. But what were your first thoughts? And when you got out of bed, what, how did you decide what to wear today? Granted, you only had a limited choice. But how did you decide what to pack to bring here? What was involved in your decisions? Was it comfort? Was it fashion? 
was it uh, that blue really matches your eyes and you'll look good to others or the weather? <laughs> and what did you do before meditation practice? Maybe some of you did some stretching or some yoga or maybe some of you went straight to the caffeine or maybe some of you pulled out a Dharma book. And even thinking about the meditation session this morning, did you follow along or did you space out? Did you change the directions to suit your own predisposition? Did you do it your own way? And what did you do between meditation and breakfast? How did you spend that half hour of time? Just check, were you seeking some kind of happiness in what you did? And notice how you prepared your morning tea or whatever you were drinking. With just the right amount of sugar or honey, just the right amount of the milk you like, you know, the soy milk, not the coconut milk. Getting it just right, as if there's happiness in that cup of tea. Right? And how did you choose what you took for breakfast this morning? What was influencing your choices of what to take and how much to take? And where to put it on your plate? Next to something and not next to another thing? And we're in silence during the first part of this retreat, so what did you think about during breakfast? Where did your mind go? And then how did you spend your time between breakfast and this 9 a.m. session? So that's just four and a half hours of our life, but look at how many decisions we made. Look how many actions we took. And what percentage of them were motivated by a wish to be happy? 50% or more? So from your own experience, that just that little bit of experience, can you see how the mind is seeking happiness 24 hours a day? I had heard many teachings like this, um, and then one day I had my first real experience of this. I was house-sitting for someone uh, in Queensland, Australia, near the beach, and I went about the time doing everything that would make me happy, you know, walking near the beach and going to have coffee. And <laughs> doing all these things, but I, at one point I noticed I was restless. There was an agitation in my mind, you know. I kept doing things to try to find happiness, and finally it was like the light went off. Oh my gosh, just like they say, I'm looking for happiness. <laughs> so we can know something intellectually, but when it drops down into our own direct experience, you know, like your BBC the other day, our own direct experience, it changes you. So this is something that we really need to investigate again and again and again. Because if we don't, chances are good we won't actually find the happiness we're looking for. That's what's at stake here. So in general, we can identify two main causes of happiness. There are external causes and internal causes. And Venerable mentioned this a little bit yesterday. The external causes we know a lot about. This is primarily how we spend our lives, seeking nice sights, nice sounds, nice smells, nice tastes, beautiful food, nice connections with people. There's nothing wrong with that until we develop attachment for those things. Then it gets us into trouble. We spend most of our lives running after these external causes of happiness, or conditions we could call them actually. And it does lead to a certain kind of happiness, no doubt about it. But if we check up, <coughs> we can easily see, or better yet, we can experience that in general, external causes aren't necessary for happiness, and they're not sufficient to guarantee happiness. The enduring kind of happiness that we actually long for 
So think about your own experience. External causes are not necessary because even in the absence of external causes, like people, um, people can be pretty happy even without those external causes. Have you noticed that? For instance, monastics don't have too many material objects. We only can have a certain number, but we're a pretty happy bunch, mostly. <laughs> I remember the first time I went to India in 1996. Uh, I was visiting Bodh Gaya, and I was, that's one of the um, most impoverished states in, in the, that country. But I was struck by how happy many of the people I saw were. They had a happiness and a carefreeness in their faces that was enviable yet they didn't have much materially. Unfortunately, since that time, materialism, Western materialism, has crept into um, their lives as well as ours. <laughs> That's what we've exported. But it was, it got my attention. Maybe you've had that experience traveling in other countries, Nepal, other places. I love it when my sister asks me, what do you need, what can I send you? And I can say, I don't need anything. It's such a free freedom. It, it, it brings joy to my mind to be able to say, I don't need anything. There's nothing I need. Except enlightenment, but she can't give me that. <laughs> or maybe more compassion, more kindness. So check up for yourselves. Are external causes necessary for you to be happy? And external causes are not sufficient. This should be so obvious to us. There are so many people on the planet right now who have every external thing they could possibly want. And, the, and many of them are a miserable lot. In fact, many of them are on drugs, they overdose, they're involved in sex scandals one after the other, etc. Right? We can see that. But somehow it's difficult for us to connect the dots. We have been conditioned to think that happiness exists outside of ourselves, in people, in things, in situations, in circumstances. You know, if I get praised, then I'll be happy, then I'll be successful. If I have enough likes on my Facebook, then I'll be successful, I'll be happy. But there are a lot of consequences to thinking that way. So if it was true that happiness existed in external things, the more of those things we had, the happier we would be. Now, I like tea. I like to have a cup of tea just the way I like it in the morning. But one cup is enough. If I have two, it's too much. Actually, coffee is a better example. You know, one, one perfect latte is really nice, or one cappuccino is really nice. But two kind of makes you a little bit jittery, doesn't it? Three really send you off through the roof. What happened to the happiness that was inside of it? Serious, what happened to it? There are people who don't like coffee. Isn't that amazing? It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Truly amazing. Um, so what happened to the happiness for them? If, if happiness existed in the coffee, where is the happiness for the people who don't like coffee? What happened to it? Where'd it go? Did it slip out? Also, if happiness existed in external things as it appears, then everyone should enjoy the same amount of happiness. You know, but some people like lattes with, you know, chocolate sprinkles on top, and other people like it in a different way. Or some of you like certain music, and your kids like other music, etc. So as human beings, we have an incredible human intelligence for examining and investigating the true causes of happiness and suffering. And so we, we need to use it. Right now, I don't think we're using it very much. You know, these things should be obvious. We're encountering these kinds of situations and consequences all the time, but we cannot connect the dots. What's the problem? All of these external causes of happiness are impermanent, aren't they? They're constantly changing. They're fleeting. Which makes them untrustworthy and unreliable to bring about lasting happiness. No matter how much we have, it feels like something's missing. Something could be better. Something's not satisfied. 
So we may know all of this intellectually. This is probably not new for anyone. We may know this intellectually, but how many times a day do we find ourselves saying, oh, if only I had fill in the blank, then I'd be happy. I wish I had blank, then I'd be happy. Or maybe we don't say it out loud, but we're saying, I wish I had X, Y, and Z. If only I had that perfect relationship. If only my partner were kinder, <laughs> not so angry. If I had that job, or if only I had a baby, then I'd be happy. <laughs> or if only I had a week to go on retreat, then I'd be happy. By myself. <laughs> okay, so there needs to be a lot of doubt in our mind about external things being able to provide this the satisfaction to this longing inside of us that His Holiness is talking about. So this is something we need to reflect on a lot, a long time actually, until it becomes we become imbued with that understanding. So that when we're standing at the pastry counter, instead of thinking, which one's going to make me happiest, you know? The one with the chocolate or the, you know, the one with the cherries on it? We actually know that there's another cause for happiness, and that's what Buddhism has to offer us, and these are the internal causes of happiness. Developing the potential within our mind itself to find inner peace and happiness. His Holiness says, if you have peace of mind, you can find happiness even under the most difficult circumstances. Wow, that's a promise, isn't it? So, probably we've all had that experience where the external situation was perfect, but our mind wasn't happy. Venerable referred to this last night. You know, have you ever gone on a vacation and you were miserable because your mind wasn't happy? The weather was good, the hotel was good, but your mind wasn't happy, and so it ruined the whole thing. And probably we've had the opposite as well, which is that we probably all experienced really challenging situations at times, but our mind was in the right place, and so we could deal with it. We could get through it relatively unscathed. So that shows the primacy of the mind in terms of our experiences of happiness. So it seems obvious that His Holiness has developed this stable kind of happiness, but have we? I haven't yet. I'm aspiring for it. And even if we haven't developed this state, hopefully we can at least see it as a potential within our mind, because our mind, the nature of our mind, is the same as the nature of His mind. It's the same as the nature of a Buddha's mind. It's just that they've developed their potential and perhaps we haven't done that yet. They've developed all the positive qualities in their mind to an utmost extent and eliminated all the opposing factors in their mind. They've eliminated all the afflictions, the distorted ways of thinking. They have perfect concordant minds, you know, that accord with reality. And that brings a lot of peace and happiness. So through the pages of, uh, oh, in How to Practice, His Holiness says, kindness is essential to happiness, essential to mental peace. And through the pages of his book, the central method for achieving a happier life is this, to train our minds in a daily practice that weakens negative attitudes and strengthens positive ones. So probably... Many of you go to the gym on a regular basis, or at least you get out and walk and do something to keep your bodies active. It seems to be a pretty um, standard value these days. But how many of us are actually exercising our minds on a daily basis? And it's good to check up to see. Are, is your mind flabby? <laughs> is your mind out of shape? Does your mind need some? Does your mu mind muscle need some exercising? So it's interesting that he's linking happiness to ethical conduct of living in an ethical way. How do you feel about that? Does that make sense? Can you see how we can talk about that in terms of ethics? In How to Be Compassionate, he says, Love, compassion, and concern for others are the real sources of happiness. With ease and abundance, you will not be disturbed by even the most uncomfortable circumstances. So, what wakes us up at night, besides someone snoring? What wakes us up at night? 
Do you ever wake up and think, I was so kind today. I want to do that again tomorrow. I'm going to lay here and think about it. Or do you tend to wake up thinking, why did that person say that to me? When I see them tomorrow, well, I'm going to say this to them. What wakes you up at night? I'm curious. Maybe you sleep well through the night. Maybe the person snoring that sleeps well. <laughs> So a mind at peace is a completely kind and compassionate mind. A mind that wants others to share that happiness and wants others to be free of suffering. This is based on that deep understanding of our own and others' fundamental nature. So the more we understand that about ourselves deeply, like through meditation, not just superficially, intellectually, but deeply experiencing that in our meditation, the more that will naturally be there when we engage with others will give them a lot of benefit of the doubt, or at least more benefit of the doubt, because we understand that they're doing what they're doing because they want to be happy. They're confused, maybe, just like I'm confused at times. So there's no greater method for de than developing a kind and compassionate mind, what we call a good heart. And that's what we're talking about this weekend, developing a good heart. So this, when we train our minds in this way, this can completely reorient how we view ourselves, how we view others, how we view the world. It's not to be underestimated. It changes our worldview. So um, our minds are impermanent. An omniscient mind is also impermanent. All impermanent phenomena have causes, compatible causes. And if we create those causes, we will achieve a compatible result. This is how it works. And so often here at the Abbey, we talk about being content to create the causes, not so concerned about the outcome, not so focused on the result, but really intent on creating the causes. So this is really getting at one of the laws of cause and effect that um, actions are definite. Positive actions, positive states of mind, positive actions necessarily, definitely lead to positive results. Boy, the more we can trust that, then that becomes the guiding post for our actions more and more. Slowly, slowly we change. And the more we trust that negative states of mind, negative actions, distorted states of mind, distorted actions, lead to suffering, the more we will turn away from them. It's humbling work to be engaged with this because in, invariably we will fall down, we will fail. But we get back up quickly and dust ourselves off and keep going. <laughs> what else are we going to do? We're going to be here anyway. We might as well work hard <coughs> and get some results. So if we understand the benefits of weakening negative attitudes and strengthening positive ones, that will support our efforts in training in these practices daily, not just when you come to retreat once a year, but daily, throughout the day. We'll have greater mental peace. We'll have less anxiety and worry, less low self-esteem. We'll have more joy. We'll, make, create, we'll create more room for joy. <clears throat> Our relationships with others will reflect these internal changes. They'll go better, they'll be smoother. And we'll become a better human being and a better world citizen. This is what His Holiness sums up in his book. I, I am Buddhist, but I also think sometimes Buddhism is a little bit too dismissive of external things, of situations and things. For example, um, I mean, clearly there are other, there are external situations that are more or less conducive to cultivating happiness than others. For example, being at a monastery is more conducive to cultivating happiness than living in Syria and having bombs raining down on you and your whole family's been killed and you're the only survivor. Uh, is it clearly, you know? So I'm thinking about cooperative conditions mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, like 
how does that work in terms of, okay, well, okay, you know, it, it, it's an internal thing, but we relate to things external, so how we relate to them. But I sometimes I think it's a little bit too dismissive. Oh, we can't find happiness things, but clearly there are situations and things where they're like, otherwise, why would I begin to treat a kindness retreat, right? Because I want to be in a place that's more conducive to cultivating kindness, not being distracted. At home, distracted by work and other life things, um, electronic gadgets. So, I wonder if you could touch on that a little bit. I'll try. <laughs> uh, what you say is true. We do need cooperative conditions so that we can put our time and energy into developing spiritually. And if we were. It one, once our basic needs are met for food, clothing, shelter, medicine, and love, I would include some love in there too, um, the research shows that the next most important aspect that determines our experiences of happiness is not external. It's internal. It's our mind. And so each person needs to decide for themselves how much is enough for me to be comfortable so that I can do what's most important to me. And then we also have to decide what's most important to us. Obviously there are people who have a lot of money who can really help others. That's a good thing. But if we're using our wealth primarily just to entertain ourselves, you know, going here and there and for no real purpose, then we, we have to take a look at that because that's an action that will have a result. Also, given the fact that we're here for a very short time, 100 years at the most, that is not very long when you think about the whole scheme of time. 100 years is a drop in the bucket. And, you know, you and I are past midlife, Dan. So, <laughs> how are we going to use our remaining moments to really make the best spiritual progress? Are we going to be running after material things, or are we really going to put more and more and more of our interest into developing our minds and hearts? It's our choice. There's no should. No one's going to stand over you with a stick. But when we think about these things, and that's what we're being encouraged to do, when we investigate these deeply, then we can come up with really informed choices about how we're going to live our lives. So for some people, maybe philanthropic work is really their calling, and so they need millions of dollars. Great, go for it. Um, but for the rest of us, how much is enough? And what's our real motivation for getting things? You know, is it just because there's a new iPhone out that we have to have it, or because the neighbors have a better car than we do, or you know, what's really the motivation? It takes a lot of honesty. I think for us to really admit to ourselves what our motivations are, and often they're mixed. So the more we can bring a clean, um, positive motivation to all the actions that we're doing, and especially around acquiring wealth and material things, just the more informed our decisions will be. That's what comes to my mind. Does anybody else want to speak to that? Remember that amazing song? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you remember that amazing movie a few years ago? I think it was called Life is Beautiful. And it was set in the Holocaust. Yeah. And in that in that tumult and horrible time, this man made his child's life so beautiful. So when I think of you know, we've got all the, we've got the Abbey here to help us be kind and beautiful like that. But um, that's really the altruistic sort of way that to really uh, get out of ourselves, I think, and think about making the moments that we have beautiful for others. I think we, I think as a society, we all recognize that that was in that movie, and that that's what was so beautiful about that movie. So, so I, you know, I keep thinking of oh, the situation we're living in now, and you know, 
all the things we've done to have clean air, and now these things are being reversed. And all this. But, I think, but then I think, well, yeah, but we're still breathing some clean air, and we still you know, do something about it. So I don't know. We have to keep thinking that bigger picture, don't we? Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I guess that comes to my mind, um, like I come to the Abbey to remind myself what real happiness is, a true happiness. I think so much in society tells us what happiness is when actually it's just suffering under a different name. You know, so a drunken night or a sexual tryst, you know, we call that happiness, but in reality we don't, you know, if we knew what we're actually capable of accomplishing, mm -hmm. I think, you know, how many people would be running to the Abbey if they actually knew what real happiness was and that we were capable of so much more than meets the eye. And I think for me, like, that's part of my confusion is that for so many years what I've called happiness was just basically suffering under a really nice name, you know, and so I come here to remind myself um, of that, of what ultimate happiness is and what true and real happiness is. made an observation in my marriage uh, that my wife, Juliet, seems to be a much more um, naturally kind person, and I have to work at it. And I've admired her for it, and I've kind of explained it as a, as a cop-out that I'm a left brain person, I'm very analytical, she's a right brain person, very creative, that that was the reason that she seems to be much more compassionate and kind. I, I, I'd be interested in what the Buddhist perspective is on, you know, people that seem to, you know, be left brain versus right brain. And, and I've been embarrassed on a number of occasions. Um, walking down the street and Juliet will see a little old lady that needs help crossing the street and I didn't even see the little old lady. <laughs> Once it's pointed out to me, I say, absolutely, we need to help this person. And this has happened on a number of occasions, a homeless person. Let's give this homeless person a dollar or two. I didn't even see a homeless person. Once it's pointed out to me, absolutely, you know, let's let's give this person something. I don't know if it's a self-centeredness or if I'm so focused on the goal of just getting from point A to point B that I don't even see the people. But she seems to have this natural, and I admire it, and uh, she's a good role model for me. Um, and, and I don't know if it's left brain or right brain or I'm just you know, so self-centered that I'm not even seeing what's around me and the suffering that's around me. And, uh, so I, I'd just be interested in your perspective. Are there some people that were naturally kind and compassionate and other people just have to work at it more? <laughs> um, you know, if we think of ourselves as a continuum, we, we've come in with... Um, a good amount of things in our backpack, our karmic backpack. And those are influencing how we are in this life, for sure. Also, the conditioning of this life influences who we are as well. But also, how we train our minds influences who we are in each moment. So I don't know about left brain and right brain necessarily. That's not the term that's used, that I've come across in the Buddhist literature or, or in teachings. But um, what stands out in my mind is that there's... There seems to be an emphasis on having both developed. You know, we need method and wisdom. We need compassion and wisdom both. We can't just do one and not the other. So um, we might have a propensity for one, and chances are good we'll want to do more in that area because it's comfortable. It's, it, it supports our predisposition and our identity, maybe. But actually, we need to bring up the other side so that um, they have equal standing, I think. And there are many ways to do that, you know. Um, 
the, also what popped into my mind when you were talking about that is if, if you were to do more mindfulness meditation, you might be surprised how much more you are aware of. And I think you're a very aware person. That's my experience of you. But in my own experience of doing more mindfulness-based meditation, in addition to analytic meditation, um, raises one's perspective in a way that's quite beautiful. And so you become more attuned to the details of what's around you. Also, the more we count our self-cherishing, I don't know if it's that for you, but the more we are cultivating loving-kindness, compassion, bodhicitta, um, naturally we're paying attention to others in our periphery. I remember um, in, in one meditation that we do, I think we're going to do the equanimity meditation one morning, or at one point, and in that meditation, one of the things that we need to do is call to mind someone specific that we think of as a stranger. And I remember a period of, of time of training where I was really working on that meditation every day, every day, every day. And it, w- it almost became fun to think, who's going to be my stranger today? It's <laughs> only I can identify so that I can have a really clear image of them in my meditation. So it, it showed me, you know, in my own experience that what we look for, we find. So what are you looking for? And what are you finding? And maybe you want to look for something else. And so there are tools to help you look for something else. You know, I've noticed that the wisdom side of the path, I have a really strong affinity for. Yeah, wonderful. The bodhicitta side... Get busy. Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> really needs, I really yeah. need to work at There you it. go. Yeah. Yeah. See that. <coughs> When I see somebody suffering, it overwhelms me, uh-huh. and I get stunned, mm-hmm. and I don't ex- take a step to help them. But, but at the same time, some of my colleagues, they will run and help. Mm-hmm. But that suffering, I, I don't know what goes on in my mind, mm-hmm. and I start suffering. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to overcome that. Uh-huh. Okay. I put myself in their shoes, and then I start suffering. Yeah. Well, I really appreciated the description that I heard last night. The difference between empathy, which is really feeling what that person is feeling, and taking that on. And if we stay just in empathy, it's easy to feel overwhelmed, because none of us want to suffer. We we want to move away from suffering. The beautiful um, quality of compassion and loving kindness, um, two things come to my mind. One is that it's based in reality. We understand Um, a little bit about karma. This person is in this situation because of karma. Now that's not to say they deserve it. Nothing like that. Nothing. But understanding this is a result of something. How, How unfortunate. And so I wish for them to be free of this. In fact, I would do everything I can to help them be free of this. What can I do to help them be free of this? You know, that's compassion in action. That is uh, a little more balanced than just the empathy by itself. So there are, are we doing a compassion meditation this weekend? I don't think we are. But I can show you some meditations you can take with you and begin to cultivate more of that attitude. But also I think it really is tied into the the entire, well, and understanding, you understand karma. You know, that's deep in your bones. So to think more deeply about that, everything everything we experience is a result of karma. That's sobering, isn't it? Both good and bad. Everything we experience is a result of karma. So we can make use of that understanding by um, when we experience something good, we can rejoice and also realize that we're exhausting the cause because we're having the result. So we need to create more causes. And the same thing is true of other people around us. When we experience something in a suffering state, uh, this is the result of of a, a negative karma ripening. And so that can fortify our determination to turn away from negative states of mind, negative actions, really, you know, so that we don't have those causes in our mind stream. And it can encourage us to do more purification. Our minds are just waiting to be purified. (laughs) So I hope that helps. Okay, good. Good, good. Dan would answer that a different way, and so now we'll get Dan's take on that.
things I've learned about compassion being here at the Abbey kind of some of these monastics is that um, when we see the suffering of others and we're overwhelmed by that suffering, um, they call that a personal distress where we're, um, we're, we're so invested or involved in the other person's suffering that we um, we're paralyzed essentially and we can't do anything because of our own emotions and feelings around that. So um, I'm not sure what the end of that would be except maybe to take a step back and um, do a purpose of all the same and just um, see the other person suffering and um, but um, trying in some ways not to be overwhelmed by the personal distress of the other person's suffering. I don't know how we actually do that. <laughs> between empathy and um, compassion has really resonated with me because I work in a field where I deal with people with trauma and we're also working with violence prevention and the trend right now is to really develop empathy in people um, as a means to prevent violence um, and and also we look at at the same time we're, we're experiencing a lot of in, field and a lot of other fields, vicarious trauma. And we attempt to balance that by doing things like creating boundaries and self-care. So you finish work and then you're supposed to shut off your empathy and go do something else. And, and so I am really struck right now that, that there may be some fields of uh, practice, professional fields and trends just in society as a whole that is misguided that we're that we're focusing more and more on developing empathy and that perhaps is developing more toxicity that we're then kind of feeding back to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could just talk about that. I don't know if that's true or how to frame that and how to take all this back and yeah. what my life there. Uh -huh. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about the Buddhist tradition is that words are used very precisely. They mean certain things. So I'm not sure when you're talking about empathy as used in your field and empathy as we're talking about it here are exactly matching up. Perhaps there is some compassion based in the empathy that's being developed out in the world. And certainly when we talk about empathy like from an NBC point of view, we're talking about really getting in touch with our feelings and needs. Um, but you don't stop there. You also have a request. You take responsibility to do something. Um, and so that seems like a, in a way, that's a compassionate action. That you're, you know, you're not just wallowing in the feelings and needs. But you take action to um, meet those feelings and needs. Either talking with someone else to, you know, see if they can help you meet those needs. Or you, it, you know, there are many ways that you can meet feeling, uh, the needs. Um, you can even meet them yourself. Attempt to, anyway. So, I think we'd have to investigate what really is included in the description of empathy in your field. I think there's some variations. Uh, but I think that in more the prevention field, that it's, it's using the term empathy and it's also relating to where that person is. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that um, it's a combination, but I think that definitely the empathy piece is... It's a good step, isn't it? Like even considering sense. someone else's point of view. How's this person feeling? What's going on for them? What's their background? How have they gotten to this situation? That's helpful to, to try to put yourself in another person's shoes. Um, but it may not be enough. So even loving kindness and compassion are understood in a very precise way in this tradition. You know, compassion, we can think of compassion as just sympathy, you know, or pity. <laughs> you poor thing, I'll have compassion for you. But that's not what's being described here. It's an understanding, it's an informed understanding. This person is suffering, there are causes of that suffering. And I'll do everything I can to help them understand those causes or help them you know, immediately to overcome that experience of suffering. 
And there may also be many times where all we can do is wish for others to be free of suffering because ultimately we have to do it ourselves, don't we? We, we can provide certain conditions, but uh, if, if another person's not willing to make changes in themselves, what can you do? At some point, it's healthier just to step back, give people options and then step back. That's, that can be real compassion. But it's, it takes a lot of wisdom to know what's the right action in any moment. So I think the more we hedge our bets and develop more love, more compassion, more wisdom, then we, we bring more information to each situation we encounter. And we'll make mistakes along the way. We can't help but do that. <laughs> but we can learn from them. That's the great thing. How about other people who are new to the Abbey? I would be really interested to hear from you in the next few minutes. Is there anything? Yes. Anything that you'd like to share from what you've heard the last two talks? How's this <coughs> landing with you? I've, I've been really touched during this talk. It brought a lot of emotions and tears and lots of sensations. Um, I find right now, you know, I've been practicing with a few things for quite a few years. Um, and I'm finding now that I really, like I come back into the world and I kind of go back into these similar states and I'm like, oh, I really need some help. <laughs> like I need it from, a, from wise people that have been doing this for a while. I, I need help because I, I flourish when I'm in these environments. Mm -hmm. Like I really feel a lot of openings. Mm -hmm. But... I'm feeling like a little child sometimes needing help. Mm -hmm. Vulnerable. Yeah. So it's, what would you advise for, you know, someone like me? <laughs> <laughs> well, where to start? I mean, just keep going. And um, it's wonderful that you've, if, if this situation, this Abbey resonates for you, we have lots of options for you to continue learning. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing is that in this tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's something called the Lam Rim, the Graduated Path to Enlightenment. The Buddha uh, gave 84,000 teachings during his lifetime, which is quite a number. And one of the scholars around the year 1000 put all those teachings in a very systematic way of studying called the Lam Rim, the Graduated Path. And so we can study that Lam Rim, that Graduated Path, so that we are developing the foundations we need to really start growing. Um, so you can do that here at the Abbey where we have an online course called SAFE, uh, Sarvasti Abbey Friends Education. Uh, there are many ways to engage with further teachings to help you get the tools that you need. And I would just invite you back again and again. And, and please have conversations with any of the monastics here and they can help to guide you, get you started, or you know, continue you in your journey. The other thing that I would just add is that, and this is not necessarily a, um, an answer directly to you, but it, it just reminded me that I wanted to say that, you know, we, how many of you had perfect childhoods? Anybody? Okay, just checking. Um, we can balance our Dharma education also with some therapy, you know, if we need it. <laughs> I'm a great proponent of therapy. You know, we have to have a pretty healthy self to really engage with deleting the self or negating the self. Um, and so why not use all the resources that are available, whether it's therapy or NBC or the myriad of things that are out there. We can learn from everything. And so um, sometimes, like if we have some missing experiences in our life, then we can certainly find ways to fill those missing experiences so that that's not the form, foremost thing in our mind, but rather that's just one piece of who we are and what we carry. Then we can really put ourselves wholeheartedly into the Dharma. So I don't, not necessarily about you, but it just reminded me that I wanted to make that point. So sometimes people come to the Abbey and they think, okay, Dharma's going to fix everything and so I can stop taking my uh, medication. <laughs> Um, don't do that. Keep taking your medication. Um, you know, all of us are mentally ill. All of us. We all have afflictions. That's our greatest mental illness. And so we're all looking for greater mental health. And Dharma can certainly take us all the way when we're ready to do that. But, but we need to be ready. 
And so we have to really be honest about where am I in my process? Um, like family of origin work, my goodness, that, that's humbling work. <laughs> but it's worthwhile, isn't it? Filling in some of the missing gaps so that we are really ready to blast off and fulfill our potential. <laughs>